In God we trust. What's the first thing you think about when you hear the phrase, in God we trust? Well, a lot of you probably think, well, that's what is printed on our money. And it has always been printed on money in the United States. It hasn't always been printed on money in the United States. In fact, it was at the time of the Civil War that Christian leaders in our nation felt like that the disasters that had been fallen our nation were perhaps due that the people of our country had disowned God. And that's biblical. If you forsake him, he will forsake you until you turn back to him. But these religious leaders made the recommendation to the then Secretary of the Treasury, Salmon Chase. And they also had the logic, not of what I just meant, only of what I just mentioned, but also that if centuries from now, someone found a coin from the United States, they might think that we were a heathen nation because we had nothing on there about God. And coins, you know, are often the longest living part of a society. We have coins from ancient, ancient coins. Well, the Secretary of the Treasury liked the idea and he commissioned the director of the Mint in Philadelphia to design a new one cent, two cent, and three cent coin. That was back when cents were worth something, you know, because they had a two and a three cent as well. And the religious leaders thought, well, it should read God, liberty, and law. But he commissioned the director of the Philadelphia Mint to come up with a declaration that stated the belief of the United States people and trust in God. The director of the Mint did so, and he came back and recommended either God, our country, or God, our trust, be engraved on the coins. Well, the Secretary of the Treasury liked that pretty much. He liked the design, but he thought to himself, I like in God we trust better. So they thought about it, but there were, unfortunately there was a law on the books from the year 1937 that prescribed what could be printed on U.S. currency and coins. So without, you know, further legislation, it would be impossible for the Mint or the Director, the Secretary of the Treasury, to make a change in this coin. So April, the Act of April 22nd, 1864, the Civil War is kind of winding down at this point. They made the recommendation, that they passed a law stating that the one cent and two cent coins from that time forward would have in God we trust engraved upon them. And then the next, the first two, the two cent coin of 1864 was the first coin minted in the United States with the phrase in God we trust on it. The very next year, 1865, Congress passed another law stating that in the future, this phrase could appear, didn't have to, but could appear on all silver and gold coins as well. And yes, they had silver and gold coins then, something else we don't see much of today. But uh, then again, it wasn't until 19, 1956 that the 84th Congress finally passed a law stating that in God we trust is the official motto of the United States and that it should appear also on paper currency. And the very next year, 1957, the first bill, the paper money, had in God we trust. So we're going to look today at what God's word says about in God we trust. Let me ask you a question. If you don't trust in God, what do you trust in? Well, some might answer that. I don't trust in anybody but myself. That's an alternative to trusting in God, is it not? A poor one, as we'll see in today's lesson. Well, we might say, well, I trust my preacher. I, I trust other men. Or you could say, I trust other gods, small g. I trust Satan. And believe me, Satan in his future role as Antichrist would love nothing better for you to than for you to trust in him. And we'll see a good example of that in today's lesson. So let's start with what God's Word says about trusting in ourselves. Open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And I want to preface this by saying there's nothing wrong with having a healthy sense of self-confidence. I mean, we need that, you know, to get up in the morning, to go to work, uh, to be of use to God. You have to have some self-confidence. But there's a big difference between self-confidence to accomplish things than becoming puffed up 
or egotistical. You know, man, it's, it's, man is notorious for when things go poorly in his life, he likes to blame God. Why did you do this, God? Why did you do this to me? But when we do something successful with our own hands, we, we don't give God the credit. We stand back and go, look what I did with my two hands. Isn't that table beautiful that I made with my own two hands? Don't forget to give God the credit for your gifts. Each, each of us has different gifts that God has given us. And give him all the glory and all the credit. Okay, second uh, epistle of Paul to the Corinthians. Verse 1, and it reads, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. Did it say Paul volunteered? No. By the will of God, he was struck down on that road to Damascus. And Timothy, our brother, under the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints, which are in all Achaia. Achaia is being a part of Greece. Oftentimes, Achaia is mentioned with the phrase or the location Macedonia as well. And when they're used together, it means all of Greece. Achaia, by the way, means in the Smith's Bible Dictionary, you'll find that it, it means trouble. And those of you that are studying 1 Corinthians uh, with Pastor Murray at this time know that the church was having trouble there. Verse 2, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Within that verse, we have the uh, Godhead. We have the Father, we have the Son, and we have the Holy Spirit in the form of the Comforter. As Christ promised, he would leave that Comforter in John chapter 14, verse 4. Who comforteth us <clears throat> in all our tribulation. Now don't overlook that. Does that say sometimes he will comfort us? Or in some tribulation? It says all tribulation. I want you to remember this verse when the tribulation of Antichrist begins. That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Of course, through the Holy Spirit, we are comforted. To me, that's one of the most beautiful things that we as the Christians can do for our brothers and sisters at the time of death of a loved one. You're able to offer truth to that person. Unfortunately, many churches teach that that loved one that passed away is out here in a hole in the ground. And when you can tell that person that has lost that family member the truth, that, that's a beautiful comfort. Verse 5, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation, that's the same word as comfort, also aboundeth by Christ. This word aboundeth, check it out in your strongs, is super aboundeth. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual, this means it's made active, check it out, in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation or comfort and salvation. We think about being afflicted for Christ, and every time I think or hear a Christian here in the stateside complaining about being afflicted for Christ, I like to point out to them in Russia, when they want to baptize somebody, they have to sneak down to the river in the cover of darkness, cut a hole in the ice, and baptize that way. Think about the, the Christians in China. You talk about afflicted, you know. Yeah, we're afflicted. Anytime you teach truth, you know, you're going to catch some affliction. But what this is saying is that the more we suffer for Christ, the more we're afflicted for Christ, the more comfort we can expect. Verse 7, And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, 
were promised there that, you know, there's, there's nothing un uncommon that has happened to man. There's nothing going to happen to you that is not common to man. That God will never give us more than we are able to handle without offering us also a way out. So when you think of being afflicted for the word, no, also, he's not, he knows what your limits are. He's not going to give you more than what you're able to handle. Verse 8, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. We thought we were going to die. And as it's written in Acts chapter 19, verses 21, and the following verses, it tells what happened to Paul in, in Asia. And there was a goddess named Diana. And the silversmiths had a real good little trade going. They were making these little Diana goddess idols, and the people were snatching them up like hotcakes. Paul told them, Diana is not a goddess. Your idols are not a god. And he wasn't a very popular fellow for it. Verse 9. But we had the sentence, some of you with reference Bibles, check your center column, that could be translated answer. And I like that. We had the answer of death in ourselves. What is that? That we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. Or you can have self-confidence, but friend, don't ever trust your soul to yourself. You know, man, since Genesis chapter 11, you know, after the flood, they built what? What did they build? They built the Tower of Babylon. In case there's another flood, we can climb up in this tower and we can climb to heaven, creating our own salvation. Whew. Dangerous. Put your trust in the Lord. Verse 10, who delivered us from so great a death. What's death? Death is Satan, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Over and over and over again, he delivers us. Don't trust in self. I mean, it's a good thing to have self-confidence, but when it comes to your very soul, don't trust in yourself. You're going to lose. What about other men? Let's turn to Psalms 118. Trusting in other men The Psalm 118, it's thought, was sung by Christ and the disciples, as it's written in Matthew chapter 26, verse 30, that they sang psalms on the night of the Last Supper. Christ is about to be betrayed, and they sang this psalm. Uh, don't you imagine Christ had on his mind at that very moment who he should trust in? You think he trusted in his disciples? One of his disciples would betray him that very night. Psalm 118, verse 1. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endureth forever. He's our Father. He loves us. He's not always looking for someone to zap, as many people believe. Let Israel now say, that his mercy endureth forever. This meaning all the laity of Israel. This obviously a, a, a psalm intended for public use. Verse 3. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let the priest say this. Not only let the priest say this, but let the priest teach this to the people. Let them now that fear the Lord say that his mercy endureth forever. These are the last verse of the converts, those that have just recently come to revere the Lord. Verse 5, I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. And the master of this reads that the Lord answered me with deliverance. He'll deliver you with deliverance as well when you call upon him. Don't forget, in times of trouble, he's your strength. Verse 6, the Lord is on my side. In the Hebrew, this is for me. And as it's written in the New Testament, if God be for us, who can stand against us? I will not fear what man can do unto me. And this made me think about it in Christ's teaching in Matthew chapter 10, 28, 
where he says, Fear not he that can kill your body, but can't kill your soul. I'm paraphrasing. Fear he, rather, that has the ability to kill both your flesh, body, and your soul in hell. That hell, of course, being the lake of fire. Verse 7. The Lord taketh my part with them that help me. We, we are one body. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. It's written several places in the Bible, touch not mine anointed. Uh, anointed, you could translate it as elect as well. And I've seen that on many, many occasions, that when the enemy attacks one of the elect, you watch two, three months down the road, God will see to it that that party pays. Verse 8, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And the reason we came here, man will let you down. Now, am I saying that you can't trust any man? No, I'm not saying that at all. Uh, but trust is something that's built over time. And especially when you're talking about trusting a preacher or a minister, don't trust that man for you with your soul. Uh, that, that's dangerous. How do you know if a teacher is, you know, God said, I'll, I'll send you teachers and, and ministers. How do you know that they are sent of God? You check out what they say right here in his word. For if it's not here in his word, you better look elsewhere to put your confidence. Verse 9. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Israel was notorious for running to Pharaoh. You know, when things got hot and the king of Assyria was threatened to take over Israel, what did they do? Did they turn to God and ask him to deliver them? No, they turned to Pharaoh. In some cases, even to the king of Assyria or king of Babylon, depending on who was attacking them from which direction. Just saying, don't trust in government rulers or heads of government. Verse 10. All nations compass me about, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. Remember, too, it's his power that destroys them in his name, as it's written in Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 19. Christ said, in my name I give you power. Now, it didn't say, he didn't say, I give you power over all your enemies. He said, in my name. Verse 11. They compass me about, yea, they compass me about, but in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. This made me think about 1 Samuel chapter 17, where David is approached by Goliath, and Goliath, you remember, is kind of a little bit peeved that they send this boy out here to take him on. I mean, he's the champion of Gath. And he told David, I'm going to cut your head off and feed your carcass to the fowls of the air and the beast of the field. What did David say to him? He said, you come to me and you put your, you come to me with a shield and a spear and a sword. In other words, you put your confidence in those things. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Not only am I going to take your head, but I'm going to feed your whole Philistine army's bodies to the fowl of the air. So... Uh, David having that, that, you know, he was a warrior, David was. But he knew where his strength was, believe me. And, and that's what I'm trying to encourage you all today. Know where your strength is. Trust in God. Verse 12. They compass me about like bees. They are quenched. The Septuagint reads here, were quenched, blazed up. I, I like to translate this consumed. So let me read it that way. They are consumed as the fire of thorns. Thorns burn very hot and very fast. For in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. Verse 13, and he addresses the enemies. Thou hast thrust sore at me. This is one Hebrew word, daka, and it means to push down, that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song and has become my salvation. No other salvation. A uh, song of Moses found in Exodus chapter 15, 2, not to be confused with the song of Moses of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32, but after God had opened the Red Sea, parted the Red Sea, and Israel passed across safely, Moses said almost these same words. Verse 15, 
The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles, the house of God, of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord doth valiantly. Who's at the right hand of God? Jesus Christ, his son, he doth valiantly. Verse 16, the right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord doth valiantly. Okay, uh, twice for emphasis there. Well, but you don't understand, Pastor Dennis. I, I, I really trust my preacher. Again, oh, would you trust him with your very soul? You know on Judgment Day that preacher is not going to be standing between you and the Lord. And there are some, I think, that trust in the church. You know, well, I belong to church so-and-so. And everyone knows they're all going to make it. Every single one of them are going to make it. Right? Let's see what God's Word says about trusting in the preachers and the church. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying... Now, is what is about to follow Jeremiah's thoughts on the matter? Mm -mm. This is the word from the Lord. Stand in the gate of the Lord's house. Where did he tell Jeremiah to stand? In the gates of God's house. Go stand in the, the entrance to that church and proclaim there this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah, that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. The ten tribes to the north, Israel, are already in captivity to the Assyrian. As we're about to see, God is not real happy with what Judah is doing either. This proclamation, in other words, is for all you churchgoers. Verse 3. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings. Change your ways and what you're doing, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Doesn't sound like God's very happy with what they've been doing. He's saying, if you want to remain and dwell in the promised land that I gave your fathers, you better change your ways. Four, trust ye not in lying words. Wait a minute, where is he standing? He's standing at the gates to God's house, saying, trust not in lying words. Where are those lying words coming from? The pulpit. Satan uses that pulpit, friends. Saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, three times for great emphasis, are these. Meaning, are these, meaning your deliverance or your salvation. In other words, what are these lying words? Well, they're of the false prophets that are using the pulpit to tell the people of Judah, don't worry about the famine. Don't worry about the enemy's sword. You're not going into captivity to the king of Babylon when God had sent his prophets and said, you are going into the captivity to the king of Babylon. Anything different? He's given, you know, the preachers were giving the people a false sense of security. Is it any different today? You don't have to understand the book of Revelations. You're going to fly away. There's not going to be a captivity to the king of Babylon, which is a type for Antichrist. Don't believe in what man says without checking out what they say in God's Word. They'll give you a false sense of security. Verse 5, the Word of the Lord continues, For if ye truly amend your ways and your doings, completely change, in other words, if ye truly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you'll be fair and do what's right, not as many today do, do your neighbor before he has a chance to do you. If ye oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, or the orphans, and the widow, that's reference to the Pentateuch, Deuteronomy 24, 17. 
and shed not innocent blood, Pentateuch, Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 10. In this place, neither walk after other gods to your hurt, Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, and Deuteronomy 6, 14 in the Pentateuch. I think what God's saying here is, I gave you this letter, and he's referring here, don't do these things that I told you not to do in the Pentateuch, the law. Then will I cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. The promised land was promised to Israel, but there were conditions at the time that the promise was made, and those conditions continued on, and the conditions weren't being met. Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. You're listening to the men that are standing at the pulpit telling you opposite of what God's Word says. That is not going to be any profit or to do you any good. Verse 9, Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom ye know not? In other words, will you, will you break almost all of my commandments? And note, there's not a period at the end of verse 9. The, the thought continues in verse 10. And come, or still come, and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered or saved to do all these abominations. You think you can break all the commandments, and just because you come into this temple that everything's okay, and listen to the false preachers. Verse 11, is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. He, he sees everything. Christ would quote from this scripture in Matthew chapter 21, verse 13, and Mark 11, 7, uh, make that 11, 17, as he would make that whip, cat of nine tails, I've heard Pastor Murray refer to it, and he drove out those that were selling mite-infested doves in the temple. And he turned over the tables of the money changers and drove them out. And he said, this house was supposed to be a house of prayer, and you've made it a den of thieves. Verse 12. But go ye now, this is the word of the Lord still, but go ye now unto my place which was in Shiloh. Notice, was in Shiloh where I set my name at the first. That was the first location of the uh, Mosaic Tabernacle. And see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. First Samuel, uh, the first several chapters of Samuel, we learn that Eli had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. What did those two boys, these are priests we're talking about here now. Remember the big flesh hook? that as they were boiling the sacrifice, the priest would go over and hook in a big hunk of flesh. And then when it was time to give God his part of the sacrifices, what belonged to God? The fat. The priest would say, well, now, wait a minute. Before we burn all that, I want you to cut that a little thicker. You know, just a little fat on there kind of sweetens the meat up a little bit. Worse than that, they slept with the women that came to the temple to minister unto the temple. God was furious. Uh, and what happened after that? Of course, the Philistines came, took the Ark of the Covenant. Eli died. Hophni and Phinehas died. They didn't die a natural death either. God took them. What is the point? The Ark of the Covenant's with the Philistines now. Total rejection by God. He's saying, if you think all this is true, Go down and look at Shiloh, where my tabernacle was, because I'm going to do the same thing to your temple here in Judah that happened to that if you don't straighten up your ways. Verse 13, And now, because ye have done all these works, saith the Lord, I spake unto you, rising up early, and speaking, but ye heard not. And I called you, but you answered not. This wasn't a surprise to anyone, any of these events that happened. God sent prophet after prophet 
telling, warning these people, if you don't straighten up, this is going to happen. And it did. Verse 14. Therefore will I do unto this house, this is the temple in Jerusalem, which is called by my name, wherein ye trust. He's indicating here, you don't trust in me, meaning the Lord. You'd rather trust in this temple, this building over here, and the false preachers that are standing at the pulpit telling you you're not going into captivity. And unto the place which I gave to you and to your fathers as I have done to Shiloh. Total rejection. Total destruction. And I will cast you out of my sight. This reminded me of First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9, where David is talking to his son Solomon just before he took the throne of Judah. And he told Solomon, well, it was all of all Israel, as a matter of fact, not just Judah. But he told Solomon, his son, if you'll seek the Lord, you'll find him. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. And that's about to happen to Judah. As I have cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim, being the larger of the ten tribes, stated for all the ten tribes. They were already in captivity to the king of Assyria. 16. Therefore pray not thou for this people, this is to Jeremiah, neither lift up cry, lift up cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. In Jeremiah 15.1, God tells Jeremiah, if Moses and Samuel, two of the greatest intercessors of all time, save Jesus Christ, I'll add, stood before me, I would not change my mind for this people. God's ticked. Verse 17, Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? Look what they're doing. There's, they've got... Uh, idols set up throughout the city of Jerusalem, even in the sanctuary in some cases. Some of the kings of Judah got off way into idolatry. So we see don't trust in ourselves, don't trust in other men, don't trust in those that stand behind the pulpit and put forth falsehoods and give you that good feeling, oh, that was a good message. I feel so good, you know, I know nothing's going to happen to me. I don't have to worry about the famine. I don't have to worry about the sword. I don't have to worry about the enemy at all. All I have to do is come here and believe. There's another entity that wants your trust. Be turning to Judges chapter 8. Antichrist will want you to put your confidence. That's another word for trust. He, he wants you to put your trust and your confidence in him. The judges, by the way, the, the, the word judge in the Hebrew is shofetim, and it's from a verb that means to make right and rule. Doesn't mean just rule, it means make things right and rule. And boy, if there was one judge that did that, it was Gideon, and that's where we're gonna pick it up right at the end of Gideon's reign. Chapter 8, verse 32, the book of Judges. And Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age and was buried in the sepulcher of Joash, his father, in Ophrah of the Abizarites. And again, a true judge was Gideon. Uh, he saved Israel from uh, the Midianites, uh, he even cut down, in fact, as the name Gideon means cut her down. And one, one of the first things God instructed him to do uh, through the angel of the Lord was to cut, take down his father's altar to Baal, his own father, and to cut down the groves. Idol worship, verse 33. And it came to pass, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel turned again and went a-whoring after Balaam, and made Baal Bereth their god. Tough words, they're not my words, that's the way God looks at it when we go after other gods, whoring after. Baal Bereth, check it out, is God of the covenant. So they're taking this non-god and making him, Baal Bereth, the god of the covenant to replace the true covenant god Yahweh. 
And the children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God, who had delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies on every side. Trouble on the horizon. Neither showed they kindness to the house of Jerubbabel, namely Gideon, according to all the goodness which he had showed unto Israel. Jerubbabel being an honorary title, uh, it means uh, he strove with Baal, and you could even add to that, and Baal could not uh, win over him, an honorary title given to Gideon. Chapter 9, verse 1, And Abimelech, the son of Jerubbabel, this is Gideon, went to Shechem unto his mother's brethren. And if we'd have started one verse earlier in chapter 8, verse 31, we would have seen that Abimelech was born to a concubine of Gideon. What could that mean? Well, that could mean that we're talking about a Mamzar here. And I submit to you, Abimelech is one of the better types of Antichrist that we will find in the Old Testament. But here he's going to his mother's house, her family, and communed with them and with all the family of the house of his mother's father, saying, and what he's here for is to say, well, okay, Gideon is out of the way. Now, make me the judge. Make me the king. Type for Antichrist, you bet he wants to be the king. Speak, I pray ye, in the ears of all the men of Shechem. Of course, this being the landowners. Whether is better for you, either that all the sons of Jerubbabel, that's Gideon, which are threescore and ten persons, seventy, reign over you, or that one reign over you. Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. Another indication to me that we might be talking about a Mamzar here. Of course, he was half Gideon, was half of the blood flowing through his uh, body, but also this concubine. We don't have any record of where she came from or who she was but we're talking about different bone and different flesh here, apparently. And his mother's brethren spake of him in the ears of all the men of Shechem, all these words, and their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, he is our brother. I mean, do we want 70? And he was probably stretching the truth. You know, not all 70 of Gideon's sons would try and rule. You know, probably one or whoever the Lord called is who should have been the judge, and it may not have been one of his 70 sons. The judgeship was not a hereditary thing, such as the priesthood or the kingship in some cases. Uh, what we have here is Abimelech trying to self-appoint himself or be appointed by men to be judge and king. And they gave him three score and ten pieces of silver out of the house of Baal Berith, one piece of silver for each of Gideon's sons, wherewith Abimelech hired vain and light persons which followed him. Not, a, not good people. And he went unto his father's house in Ophrah and slew his brethren, the sons of Jerubbabel, being three score and ten persons upon one stone. Notwithstanding, yet Jotham, which means Yah is upright, the youngest son of Jerubbabel, was left, for he hid himself. The fact that they were all killed on one stone indicates that they were murdered execution style. These, these are his own brothers, half-brothers. And all the men of Shechem gathered together, and all the house of Milo, and went and made Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. Better translated, the oak that was in Shechem. Evidently, it was a well-known oak tree. That's what, if you'll check it out in the Hebrew, that's what this plain of the pillar is, is an oak tree. And when they told it to Jotham, and it's, that just hit me too, that that oak tree there uh, might somewhat be leading up to the parable that we're about to cover, for it most certainly covers trees. Verse 7. And when they told it to Jotham, this is the legitimate son of Gideon, he went and stood in the top of Mount Gerizim and lifted up his voice and cried and said unto them, Hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. 
And again, what we're going to get into in the next verse is a parable. Um, it is prophetically significant, though, as we'll see. Verse 8, the trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, reign thou over us. And what we've got here, trees are symbolizing men, which is often the case in God's word. And what they're saying is, let's, let's, let's find a new king. And of course, we know the king of kings, the Lord of lords, and it's not the tree that we're about to see step up to the plate. Verse 9, But the olive tree said unto them, Should I leave my fatness, wherewith by me they honor God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? No way. I, you, I don't want to be the king. Verse 10, And the tree said to the fig tree, Come thou and reign over us. Anytime you hear fig tree, your ears should perk up. Uh, we could spend more time on that, but not for the sake of time, I won't. Verse 11, But the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit and go to be promoted over the trees? I think not. Remember, uh, there are some fig trees that produce good fruit and sweet fruit, and there are some that don't. Verse 12, Then said the trees unto the vine, Come thou and reign over us. You come and be our king. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? No way. Three candidates... Three refusals. Again, this is all coming to the fact that we have one king of kings, and that's what the people should, the trees, the pe symbolized by the people symbolized by the trees should realize. We have one king. There's somebody else that wants to be king. Verse 14. Then said all the trees unto the bramble. The bramble is being a thistle. Come thou and reign over us. The thistle always symbolic of Satan. And the bramble, or thistle, said unto the trees, If in truth you anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Put your trust in my shadow, says the symbolic tree of Satan. Only one problem. Thistle tree does not put forth any shade. So if you go for comfort and shade to the false Messiah, you're listening to a lie. You're deceived. Jotham would continue this parable, and I'll just paraphrase it for the sake of time. But what he would say is, if you men of Shechem did my father Gideon's house right after he delivered you and saved you from the Midianites, and you, you still want him to be your king, if, you, if he did right to those 70 sons, my 70 brothers, then take Abimelech to be your king. You deserve each other. But if you didn't do Gideon right, let fire come out of Abimelech's mouth and consume the men of Shechem, and let fire come out of the men of Shechem's mouth and consume Abimelech. So there is someone else that wants to trust, wants your trust. This truly is awesome to me, what we're about to go to. We trust God, right? I want you to know that he trusts some of us with something very, very important. Let's go to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Quite an honor to be trusted by God. First Thessalonians, the teachings of Paul, chapter 2. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance, or our coming, in unto you, that it was not in vain. We, we didn't come to you with a bunch of empty, vain words. We, we brought the Holy Spirit, the teachings of the Holy Spirit in Jesus Christ to you. Verse 2. 
But even after that, we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. In Acts chapter 16, verse 22, uh, they were beaten and thrown in prison. You know, if you ever wanted to be an apostle, think about it. Just, just look at how Paul was treated. I mean, he had it rough. Verse 3, For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness or impurity, nor in guile, which could be translated trickery. We didn't come here with a bunch of, of false teachings. We came here teaching the Word of God, the reason we came here, verse 4. But as we were allowed of God, this word allowed it could be translated approved or certified, to be put in trust with the gospel. Are you honored? To be put in trust with the gospel? That's the good news that lets our brothers and sisters that are lost in this world of darkness find deliverance on their own. Even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. Paul never did worry about pleasing men. He was a whole lot more concerned about pleasing God, and he would. Some people God won't trust. Go with me to Luke chapter 16. To conclude, Luke chapter 16, verse 1. And he said, this is Christ speaking, also unto his disciples. What is a disciple? A, a disciple is a student. Are, are you one of his disciples, I'll ask? I know you are. There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. Let's pull this up to speed real quick. Who's the rich man here? It's our Father. God in heaven is the rich man here. Well, what's a steward? A steward is one that's given responsibility to run the house or over the goods of his Lord. In this case, let's use capital L, Lord. We are all stewards. We're all disciples. Verse 2. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Or, or what is this I hear of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship. And brothers and sisters, we will all be called to account of our stewardship. I ask you, are, are you ready? Something to think about. For thou mayest no longer steward. In other words, you're fired. Now put this in a spirit, you know, think of this spiritually too. God entrusts some of us with the gospel to carry it forward. Some he can't trust because they're abusing the privilege. And that's what this is all about. Verse 3. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig. In other words, to dig, I'm not strong enough. To beg, I am ashamed. The steward seems to be ashamed to beg, but he's not ashamed to embezzle. I am resolved what to do. I, I know what I'll do. That when I am put out of the stewardship, in other words, out of my master's house, they, and this is the debtors we'll see in the next few verses, may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him. And said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? Verse 6. And he said, An hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and sit down quickly, and write fifty. In other words, in secret or hurriedly, change it from a hundred to fifty. Knocking fifty percent off of what he owes the Lord. But now this guy, the debtor, owes him. So when he gets thrown out of his master's house, He's got a place to go now. Hmm, he's thinking ahead. Verse 7. Then said he to another, And how much owest thou? 
And he said, An hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and write four score, eighty. Now, wait a minute. He gave the first guy a 50% cut. He only gave this guy a 20% cut. I got to thinking about, you know, why would that be? Well, maybe he didn't have as nice a house as the guy that he gave the 50%. And if the guy that he gave the 50% turned him away and wouldn't let him in, maybe the guy that he's given 20 would. Verse 8. And the Lord commended the unjust steward. Remember, this is, this is in reference or symbolic of our father. And he's commending the unjust steward. Why? Because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. The children of this world are worried about the things of this world, and they're more shrewd at looking ahead as far as things of this world are concerned. But I ask you, are they really looking ahead? Verse 9, And I say unto you, make, this is Christ speaking, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, the riches, that when ye fail or when you die, they may receive you into everlasting habitation. Friend, that's one everlasting habitation you don't want any part of. It's called hell. 10. He that is faithful in that which is least, in other words, of this earth, is faithful also in much. And he, that, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Verse 11, If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, the things of this world, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Will the Lord commit to your trust the gospel? He certainly trusts this ministry, and you're a part of that, to carry that gospel forward to our brothers and sisters that are lost in the world. So, in summary, in God we trust. We don't put our trust in ourselves because we know we're weak in the flesh. We don't put our trust in other men. Other men will do you wrong. God will never do you wrong. We don't put our trust in false teachers of his word. We don't put our trust in some church thinking that, oh yeah, everybody knows this whole church is saved. Every member of this church is saved. That's interesting thought. Trust in the Lord, especially, friends, when it comes to your soul. Because on Judgment Day, no one will be standing between you and our Heavenly Father. Let's go to the throne. Yahweh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word, Father. Uh, we thank you for being with us this day, Father. We praise you, Father. We ask for the latter rains in this time, Father. Strengthen us all. Uh, be with us as we continue to pray for this wonderful Passover weekend coming up. Father, we ask that you watch over those that are uh, going to be en route on the road to Passover, whether that be flying or driving. Uh, we ask for a safe journey for all, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. Free introductory package. Say, this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars. We're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of. A tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered and the Mark of the Beast tape. What is this Mark of the Beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. It's in your forehead, which is to say, in your mind. Have you been deceived? This is a free offer to you, one time to each new student. Say, find out what's really happening and what the story is on the Mark of the Beast. Uh, now, Satan can definitely hear what you say, or whether that's in a prayer or anything else. Um, he can hear that, and then, yeah, you have to be careful what you say out loud because of that. And, um, he cannot read our minds. Pastor Murray has a, uh, a good tape called Heart Knower 
that goes into the fact that, that God can read our thoughts and, and our minds and he knows our heart, but Satan cannot. And that's something important for you to know about. Richard in New Jersey, when Satan comes claiming to be God, will he be able to read our minds? Well, that's ironic, and no, he won't be able to read our minds, that tape heart knower. A good one to study. Wilma in North Carolina, if Satan is a spirit beating, being with no gender, how can he impregnate anyone? Oh, I'd, no one said he doesn't have a gender, uh, but it's definitely a fact that he impregnated, and this throws a lot of people because they've been fed the line about the apple tree in the Garden of Eden their whole life. But go to, the, go to your Bible, read your Bible. No place in Genesis where you find anything about an apple tree. And I can hear it now. He said there's not any apple trees in Genesis. Check me out. I'm not fibbing to you. Look in your Bibles. And while you're looking through Genesis, turn to Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. For you know what God told Eve after she partook of the tree of good and knowledge? He said, I will multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. Do you know what the word conception means? Well, I hope you do. I don't want to have to go into a great deal of extent to explain it to you. And you know what? Satan wasn't the only one that was capable of impregnating women. Uh, the daughters of Adam, as you can read in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, the sons of God, this being the Nephilim, the fallen angels, uh, came to earth, and they also impregnated women. They had children. They were the giants, the Geber. I'm way out of time. I've got to tell you all that I love you a great deal because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in depth. You know what? It just makes God's day when He looks down and He sees you seeking Him, seeking knowledge of Him in His Word. And we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that and to reach out to others as well? One thing more important than any of that, you stay in His Word. Every day in His Word is a good day. Do you know why? It's because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you. victims of Hurricane Katrina and thousands of other disasters across the country each year. Call or visit redcross.org today. I am the port in the storm. Since your feet are connected to the rest of you, walking not only gets you someplace, walking helps.